John, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having good, me. Good to see you. Uh, incredible album. Oh I interviewed you once before. I did not know you were a musician then. Yeah. And then I got a chance to listen to this album this morning. And it's great. There's a ton of different influences that I kind of, I, some of which I recognize. Mm -hmm. I'm sure some of which you'll surprise me with. But your parents are folk musicians, right? So this goes back a long way for you. Yeah, definitely. My parents um, have played music as a, as both as a hobby and, and semi-professionally my whole life. And they took me and my sisters to a, a myriad, you know, of, of um, community centers and arts fairs and folk festivals. And so from a very early age, I was um, shown and exposed to a lot of folk music and a lot of roots music and a lot of world music. And, um, and it started working on me from a very early age on. And, uh, and a lot of the stuff that I think I started listening to when I was younger that I kind of w went on to reject as a rebellious teenager who just wanted to listen to punk rock and everything. It actually found its way back in, uh, in a big way, I think, once I kind of got through that. And then this record kind of, in a, in a way, I feel like is the kind of bridging the gap between those two things. There's some more ballad-driven kind of singer-songwriter folk stuff, but there's, I still wanted it to have a hard edge. And at times, you know, I wanted it to kind of sound like a punk record at the same time that it sounded like a kind of more like a 70s Laurel Canyon kind of throwback. So it is a bit all over the map in that sense. I think I threw out Billy Bragg to you when I saw you in the green room, and that yeah. to me is sort of that bridge between folk and, and punk in, yeah. in, in, in many ways. And you sort of get that, whether you intended to or not, I found right off the, right off the bat with the, the first song on, on, the, on the album. That's great to hear. Now that Wilco, the, the Mermaid Avenue record, was, that was huge for me, as it was for the world. <laughs> What were some, I'm curious what some of those influences were that you had, or not that you had, but uh, that were instilled in you that you rejected when you got into punk that you came back around to, some of those early folk folk Yeah, people. I think it was uh, like, you know, my hero is, you know, John Prine. I think he's one of my favorite songwriters, and that was something that my, my mom and dad, they would play his songs, they just knew his songs. And when I was younger, I thought maybe that they had written them, um, just hearing them play them around the house. I was like, yeah, mom and dad, pretty good song. Uh, and then I got older and realized, you know, that it was like, oh, no, that's a James Taylor song, and that's a Jackson Brown song, it's a John Prine song. And so there was a lot of um, kind of uh, confessional, acoustic kind of uh, folk music that I then didn't, I mean, that's not, not even to say that I rejected I always still loved it, but, you know, then I started buying Nirvana records well, when and you get in, records. When you get into punk in your teenage years or anything a little bit harder edge, J Jackson Brown just doesn't cut it. Well, you're not but even... when you <laughs> cool down at 25... You're kind of like, whoa, Jackson like, Brown is the this man. This guy is like, speaking the truth right now yeah. to me. And it would <laughs> be the kind of man, thing. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> and it, for, uh, for every man's a great man. Well, it's probably one, one of my favorite records. But um, and it, and then at school, you're not even really allowed to. You might even still go home and listen to that stuff, but you're not certainly not allowed to tell anybody in school that that's who you're like going home to, to listen to. And it's not until you find that all of your peers start sort of remembering that Fleetwood Mac is good that you can also be like, well, check out Jackson Brown, too. Like, yeah. he, you may not think so, but he's good <laughs> but as well. check this out. Yeah. We went and saw him. My parents took me to see him in concert in Philadelphia when I was in the seventh grade. And uh, I was standing on my chair going crazy. Because I couldn't see, and it was a big music center, and everybody stood up. And now you've been you've been writing music for a really long time, right? And I'm, yeah. I'm curious, most people would know of you first as being part of some of the biggest musicals in the in the last year, or American Idiot or, or Spring Awakening. Did you ever find that sort of the the way that musicals were written or the songs for musicals started to affect how you wrote songs as well? Or did you try to keep those things very separate and compartmentalized? I mean, I think that the, the fact of the matter is that if you're exposed to something, if you're around it a lot, like it's going to get its hooks in you in some way or another. And so I wouldn't say that I was ever thinking like, ah, yes, I want to... Uh, write songs that sound more like they're in a musical theater kind of vernacular, but I think just the idea of storytelling, like I, I got really into the idea of like the, the economy of storytelling in songs and the fact that in musicals it's done very, very kind of, uh, uh, kind of effortlessly. And um, I, I, looking back on it, I can see that that was kind of happening. I feel like that was working its way into into my songwriting, the idea of like, okay, so how can I tell an economic, like an economic story? How can I get from 
you know, point A all the way to point B with all the kind of weird twists and turns that happen in the middle of it in under four minutes. Because when I started writing songs, I'd be like, I'm going to write storytelling songs. But then they would be nine and a half minutes long and they're just really rambling and really kind of test the, the patience of the Of listener. your parents. Who you and my playing. parents. And, you know, <laughs> and of myself for trying to remember all the lyrics. I mean, I have a hard enough time remembering my songs that are three minutes long. So, um, so I think that, that to, to long-winded the sea, answer your question, it's happening right now. That you was know, one of the that. songs. That was that, great. That was one song. Did we record Record that? Can I? The title please? of that song was how I came to write storytelling songs yeah, in a short exactly. form version. It's going to be track one of my follow-up record, <laughs> which we just started recording live right now. How many um, how many songs did you have going into recording this album? I had I going into recording the record. I had about fifty plus original songs, and uh, and then we, <laughs> we just put nine <laughs> on the first record. How did you do, how did you decide the nine? I mean, it, you could just say that it was the these were the ones that I liked best, or the ones that we recorded best. Right. But was that it, or was it a more dis a decision about what you wanted to say with this album? Well, thankfully, um, it, it happened, I think, because my producer, Tad DeBrock, who also plays um, half of the guitar, he plays half the guitars, and I play half the guitars on the record. And uh, he really was instrumental in getting me to make the record. It was a thing that I'd been talking about for years, and we'd been playing music for a while. We actually met doing Spring Awakening. He was the guitar player in the band on stage. And we hit it off. And uh, we knew that we had a lot of songs to pick, and he basically just said, well, remember that concert we did a few months ago? Because we had done a, a first concert as a band where we put this band together that ended up being the band that played on the record. And we learned nine songs for the concert. And he was like, remember that concert we did at Bowery Electric in July? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, that, well, let's just make that the record. And it was, we really did. We just picked the nine songs that we knew as a band. And I actually, I actually think it was only eight. Uh, no, it was seven. And then we added two more. <laughs> we had learned seven of my original songs and then um, tagged on two more and learned them. And so it happened in that very random way. We didn't kind of go through all of the songs that I had written. We knew that that was going to be too much, and we only had a few days to record it. So this was kind of an organic process. This wasn't like the idea, which I think a lot of people would assume as someone who's on television and is in movies sometimes and is in theater, this idea of like, oh, the actor took a break and now wants to become a singer-songwriter and record the album. It sounds like you were already kind of doing these things and you just had an opportunity to record, so why not? Yeah, I had been trying to do it for a long time and I had, I had gotten close. I had set up, I had talked to a producer then I would talked to a, a studio about booking some time and then, you know, a lot of times what would happen was I'd get really amped on that and then I'd be fortunate enough to have an acting job come along and I go, oh, I can't really turn that down right now though, so I'll put the music on hold. And then in between season one and season two of, um, of the newsroom, that show that I was doing for HBO, I suddenly found myself with a little bit of time and a little bit of money saved from doing that show. And so um, Tad kind of wrestled me into doing it, realizing that we could do it quick and that if we just kind of got in and got out and I paid for it and just kind of was this like... This is a self-funded like, album? Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. That's it, not cheap. No. It, uh, <laughs> that's why we did it in six days. <laughs> that's why we didn't take our time. That's why we didn't like go be like, all right, let's gonna hold, we're hold up in the studio and make the white album. No. The bathroom, so you cannot go to the bathroom. Get over no, there. I was like, you get recording. back here. We, we are not done. No, we did it really quick. We, did, we tracked bass and drums in one day, and every vocal on the record was sung in the same vocal session. So uh, I did all the vocals in one day. And now, I'm curious because you, I brought up the musical theater thing because you don't get a sense of that to me, of musical theater in the, in the music at all. And I wouldn't assume that. But I'm wondering how you came to becoming a performer for musical theater after having rejected people like Jackson Brown and become more interested in punk rock. Because I remember myself in high school having rejected a certain amount of music and being into punk rock and being like, musical theater? No way, yeah, man. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, it was weird. You know, when I was a teenager, I, I much, uh, you know, like a lot of people, I think, in my generation that were doing, that was doing community theater and stuff like that, you know, I discovered Rent and I heard the cast album of Rent and I thought, you know, it, it had absolutely changed my life and I never heard anything like it. And it was kind of part of the reason why I wanted to become an actor, why I wanted to move to New York. But by the time that I got to New York, I had learned the hard way by going on a couple of auditions for musicals that it was not where I fit in. And I was going in there and I, I didn't have any vocal training and I didn't seem to, to be able to do what they wanted you know, people to do in those auditions. 
Um, and so I made a point of being like, oh, well, that was a nice dream while it lasted, but no more musicals, uh, no more musical auditions for me because it was too stressful and embarrassing. And then I said yes to one because it was for this musical Spring Awakening, and they convinced me that it was not a problem, that I didn't have any training. And they were like, look, you know, we don't care that you can't read music or that you haven't worked with a vocal coach. We, we heard that you played music. Just bring your guitar in and sing a Beatles song or something. And, and that's what I did, and that's how I got into what Spring Awakening. What did you Awakening. sing? I sang This Boy which is a cut off of Meet the Beatles, which was the first, I think maybe the second US release the Beatles ever did, and it's a really pretty song. Um, and, the, you know, they, I, think I, saw, I think they saw something in the fact that it was a rough around the edges, and I, it wasn't clean or polished or anything, and that it actually made sense for the character, so it became character-driven. And so I, 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 it's funny to me that I, I think still today I'm kind of most known for the, you know, the two musical theater things that I've had a, um, a part in, but to, to me, it's. I feel like I just got so lucky. I feel like I stumbled into them, and then doing American Idiot as the follow-up. Um, I don't think that that would have happened to me if it wasn't because it was the same director <laughs> as, <laughs> as Spring Awakening, and we had such a great time working together that he was like, "Come do this other one," and I was like, "Are you sure? Okay." Right. So it's not necessarily that you were kind of like a musical theater actor, or however we kind of quote that or right. put that in quotes. It's sort of like a you wanted to try it and you got this thing, and they cast you because almost you weren't a sort of typical music, musical theater actor. Yeah, and I remember kind of having that, I was a bit torn with it, I was like, well, do I want to do this? You know, and then I remember hearing the music for the first time from Spring Awakening, and I was like, okay, don't like chicken out just because you're nervous about this. This is some really exquisite music, and it sounds like a cool challenge, and why not just kind of go for it? And, and that, that was three years before we even made it to Broadway, so it, it was a, a long kind of process, but it was, it was such a bit of a gamble. I even left my final audition. I remember I walked out of my final callback for Spring Awakening because I was scared. Because I like went in and there were so many kids and they were learning the songs and I couldn't read the music and I was standing next to the people trying to listen to them and sing. The, and I was like, I'm out of here. And I left <laughs> and called my manager and then she was like, no, go in there, do it. Just go in the back and pretend that you can do it. It was basically what I did. Um, and it's you know it's a really good thing that I went back in there because it changed my life. You know, in, in so were you ever ways. nervous uh, going into recording this album? I mean, when you decided that you wanted to start performing your your personal songs live, even recording an album, were you ever ner nervous about the sort of perspective people have as an, of, of actors becoming musicians and so on and so forth? I mean, Russell Crowe, Keanu Reeves. I mean, it, it dates back the the number of successful actors that join bands. Yeah, absolutely. I think the nerves are why it, it took me so long to make it in a lot of ways because I was like, no, it's got to be perfect and it has to be the statement that says, no guys, I swear I've been playing music just as long as I'm an actor and you know, of course there's the... But you the, get a sense of when you listen to the album. It doesn't sound like a thrown together right. actor trying to... You, you know, I think a lot of times people that perform as an actor are like, all right, go out and hire me a producer, uh, you know, this, that, A, B, and C and put, put together a package for me. Get to Hire some songwriters and then bring me back some songs and I'll, you know, it's like, um, there's nothing wrong with that method that is great and a lot of people make some amazing music that way but you know I wrote every song on the record and that had actually they'd all been written three plus years before it even um, happened but I was scared yeah definitely it's it's always a little scary to uh, you know I think to to throw something really intimate out there and be like well here it is and now it's up to people to decide how they feel about it and where they want to categorize it and it's not up to me anymore to say that it's this kind of song or this kind of song, that kind of song, it's going to be up to the listener now. And it's always kind of terrifying to hand something over like that. It's a much that. more vulnerable place, I would imagine, than performing somebody else's words or being directed by somebody or somebody else's work. Yeah. I mean, if, a, if an episode of the newsroom goes down, Sorkin takes the hit on that one, right. you know? Yeah. If, this, if the album you know, gets criticized, that's, there's that's only, you. There's only one guy whose fault that was. <laughs> and it was my producer, Ted DeBrock. So, <laughs> uh, no, uh, yeah, no, definitely. The, when you're out there, that's the thing that I love about the music is that there is no filter. The, the collaboration working on a film project or a, a theater project is so cool because the idea that it's like, wow, it's, you know, we, this is something bigger than any one person. That's magical. I love that about being in an ensemble. Um, but I also really love the idea of you know doing something that comes from me because it's like well there's there's not as many filters here it's just coming through the way that I you know that I kind of conceived it and wrote it and that's um, yeah that's scary but at the same time it's just like it's worth it it's a uh, you know a very liberating kind of roll of the dice. Have your parents heard the album? Yeah. Yeah. Well, how did they respond the first time they heard it? Having been musicians and taking you to so much music I'm sure it must have been sort of an experience. They for them. dig they dig it they're way into it I think that. They were surprised that it was such a rock and roll record. Um, 
uh, you know, I've been playing solo acoustic shows in New York most most of the time in the last few years. Like the the band thing didn't really come about until the last few years. And um, for every rock uh, heavy song that's on the album, I have several that are you know a finger pick kind of acoustic kind of ballad, much more in the John Prine Jackson Brown kind of you know I inspiration. Love that means so I much like to the, me. I like those songs a lot. I feel like I th it's like sounding like I don't like them in the, the in this interview. I swear I love them. I love them. Um, they really are some of the, the biggest influences on me. But um, I think my you know my. My, you know, my dad was like, the record's great. But on the next one, you have to have this song, this song. You know, he's like got, he's, I think he's got his record like uh, picked out that he like wants me to make. Because, you know, that he's of, a right. of, of the more folk. He kind sees of where it can go. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, he should, I'm, I'm going to see if my, I'm going to call my dad right now and see if he wants to produce it. But, um, but no, they, they love it. My, my parents, uh, you know, it, this, we can all kind of say a thing like this because it's, a lot of it's true, but, you know, I would have nothing without them. And, they gave me the music from a, a, an early age and, and never, you know, they, they never twisted my arm about anything. They never pushed me into to being an artist or to being an actor, to be a musician. They just kind of like planted the seeds and have been, uh, you know, so nurturing and nourishing there to like let it happen. I mean, they were kind of, my mom was really getting like angry that it wasn't out. She was like, okay, so you recorded it and where is it? I, where's my copy? She even got, like the other day when it came out, I was so busy doing all this other stuff and my mom called me and was like, Okay, so is my copy of the physical thing in the mail? Like, I, I already bought it on iTunes, but I need the physical copy as well. And I was like, so then I went and played a show in my hometown, and finally got my mom. Where's copies. your hometown again? Wilmington, Delaware. Wilmington, Delaware. So that's where they still are. When did you come to New York yeah. to become an actor? In the winter of two thousand and two. Wow. Yeah, right, right before the. Uh, so you're like the 18, New Year. 19 years old. I was old? eighteen years old. Yeah, and I moved up to do my second play off Broadway. Yeah. Were your parents nervous or just fully supportive? They 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 had your back the Man, whole way. Man, if they were looking back on it, if they were nervous, they certainly didn't let on. They were really so supportive, and I think that you know, and they were like, "This is you know, this is your if you need help, let us know, but also go do it because it's your thing now, you know." Oh. And uh, they've been that that mixture of hands on, hands off, loving and supportive ever since. I feel so lucky. Oh, that's awesome. I think we have some time for uh, audience questions. Anybody have questions out here in the audience? We're going to start with a question from an online viewer. So Riley would like to know, what is your favorite venue to play? Hey. Well, there's, uh, I haven't played that many. <laughs> that <laughs> Embarrass electric. Embarrassingly <laughs> enough. Uh, I love playing the Rockwood Music Hall. That's who produced the, uh, they put out the record on the Rockwood Music Hall recordings label. Um, they have three beautiful stages, and I always have a good time playing there. And actually, I just played uh, in my hometown, Wilmington, Delaware, at a venue called The Queen, and that was amazing. That was really, really fun. Um, so, yeah. Hi, Crystal. But I just saw the Deaf West version. Did you see that? It was I amazing. didn't see it, oh. and I'm really kicking myself about it. Um, is it's one of those things where I heard about it. I heard about it when it opened in LA, and I was so excited. And I was like, Ah, oh, if that ever comes to New York, I've got to see it. And and then I was invited to the opening, and I was out of town. And then I was like, oh, Don't forget, it's you know, it's, you know, it's not going to stick around forever. And then I woke up one day, and then someone was like, Oh, you know, it closed yesterday. I was like, No. So. I'm I'm ashamed to say that I missed it, but I'm glad it was good. Though, yeah. You can tell me about it later, <laughs> later on. Next question. Hi. Um. So I just wanted to know your songwriting process and what goes into that. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, a lot of it is is done um, alone. It's a. I write most of it. Even the the more kind of rock driven songs usually start just me and an acoustic guitar. Um, because the schedule uh, as an actor um, it doesn't always leave me with the, the, the most free time. I don't have like a uh, like a structured writing time. I have a lot of songwriter friends that really are like, no, I sit down from like 11 a.m. to you know 4 p.m. and I write songs. And it's never happened that way for me. I'd like to try that sometime, but um, I kind of just have to try and keep keep it open for whenever that kind of lightning bolt is going to come along and. And uh, and then I've been known to like leave a dinner to record to sing something on my phone so I don't forget it later so that I can pick up the process when I get home and you know sometimes it uh, starts with a lyric sometimes it starts with the title right now I feel like I've been lucky that I keep the process kind of open and I'm like letting it evolve and change but I would like to try a different structure at some point just to see what that is because there's so many 
cool different ways that you can uh, get inspired. But right now, it's basically all over the <laughs> all over the map. Are you taking a break from acting right now while you're, while you're I'm performing? I'm not. I actually just kind of a um, a, a co um, happy coincidental break just kind of happened right now, and I, I realized that in the fall, and then I was like, okay, so I have to put the record out in January because in a couple of weeks I'm starting rehearsals for a new play on Broadway. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I'm doing Long Day's Journey Into Night, the Eugene O'Neill play. Um, That's incredible. Broadway. Yeah. I Would you consider yourself it. more of a theater actor than a, than a TV and film actor? I have more experience in it, for sure. Uh, I, I definitely have um, more time. I've logged more hours you know, on, on stage than I have on, on film. Um, but uh, I, I love them both very, very dearly. And I, in fact, when I was early on in doing plays, I remember that I, I was always I had to be kind of pulled out and upward to uh, be bigger and a little more grander. Um, and so when I got to go back to doing more film and TV after doing years, like, you know, like eight years of theater, it was actually really refreshing to embrace like smaller moments and quiet moments because that's actually like where I tend to want to go. But as we all know, on stage, that doesn't usually serve the, um, the storytelling. So and I feel really lucky that I've been able to do both. And I haven't done a play in five years. So I am a little nervous about <laughs> being like, oh, like a longest, craziest, most dramatic American play ever written. I'll do that one after a five-year break. You'll be fine. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Next question. Hi. Hey. I was wondering how it feels for you to sing your own words in a concert versus saying someone else's words in a show. Yeah. Um, it's great. I, I really love it. Um, and I feel really like any time that I get to get up and, and play like something that I wrote is a, a time that I feel very where I feel very lucky. Um, it's also a little scarier um, because uh, like like we said before, you know, if the song doesn't work, it's all it's all my fault. Um, but that challenge is kind of great because there have been times where you know I've written something and I've thought, oh, wait, this is just way way too vulnerable, way too open, w way too honest about some feeling that I'm having. I can't, I can't sing this in front of people. And then you go for it, and then maybe you just reach that one person in the audience that comes up and says, like, that lyric, you know, and it might be the lyric that I was scared to share because I thought that it was too, too raw or too bare, and then you realize that, no, it's worth taking those chances because y you never know who, who it's, it's going to find and what it's going to mean to them. Also, the flip side of a song possibly being your fault and not working is that you can do something about it. You can right. you can change it. You can fix it. Whereas if you're in a play or a musical and a song for yourself is not working, it takes a it takes some brass balls to walk up to the writer or the yeah. director of the musical and be like, I don't know if this be one's like, really working. Have you thought about it this way? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. If it's yeah, if it's going wrong, you can always be like, oh, let me go rewrite that yeah. real quick for the next night. And I do that all the time. There have songs that I've played one way for seven years, and then I'm like, ah, there's the lyric, and then I change it. <laughs> That's what comes when you don't make any records. You can change it as much as you do want. Do you feel like you can kind of put these songs that are on the album to bed, and you'll never change them, or do you think that you might end up changing these in the future as well? That's a great question. No, I think that there's all. I think the uh, you know I love. The idea that the kind of live that that the, you know that the record version is you know I don't think that I would ever go and be like let's re-record them because we didn't do them good enough you right. know um, but I love the idea that you know that live anything goes you can kind of try something and for, especially because a lot of the songs on the record are so uh, so arranged you know that I do still do acoustic solo singer songwriter shows and I find that like oh some of them don't really lend, the arrangements don't lend themselves to that, so I still have to make little modifications in that sense, and it's kind of fun. Some of it can be kind of challenging, but it, I love kind of playing around with them and seeing how far you can go with them live and everything. Absolutely. I think, uh, last question, right here. Hi. Yes, you are special. It is the <laughs> last question. I know, it's question. a lot of pressure. Um, coming from a musical background, do you prefer being on the stage in a musical or in a straight play? That's a good question. Um, they're both really, oh, they're so fun. Um, there's something, the musical is, is obviously such a, a different kind of energy because since it is m musically driven, you know, the audience tends to be able to just interact a little bit more. It's rare that you finish like a scene in a play and people are like, woo, great scene, you know. <laughs> it's like a kind of uncouth. I don't think that in Oatly Gene O'Neill people are gonna be like, yeah. Awesome. Um, so it's nice to be able to have that 
kind of instant feedback, but there is like a really like chill in inducing like other world where if you're doing a play and you're like in the middle of a scene, it's just like, it's kind of like time stops. And if you just hook into something with the other actor where you're kind of doing this dance with each other, that's like a very magical thing that could happen. So, I mean, I, I do, I don't want to cheat the, the answer by saying that I, I like them both equally. Um, but, uh, but I do, <laughs> and I did. Uh, uh, last question, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask this. It's, it's so dumb of me to have not started it. Six Day Hurricane, where does that come from? Yeah, Six Day Hurricane was just, a, it j jumped out very organically. I had a, a, a notebook where I was jotting down every kind of possible album title that I could think of, and I was going through the lyrics and pulling out the lyric and trying to find themes, and, and nothing was really like working. Nothing really seemed to be like, here's a record, and then, um, it, we recorded it in six days, oh, yeah. and uh, oh yeah, okay, and it's all coming back. Now. Well, I got and, it. But I the hurricane it. part was it actually we recorded it. To, to this will tell you how long it took me to get the record out. But uh, we recorded it the day we started tracking was the day that uh, Hurricane Sandy hit the East Coast, and so we were recording it in New York, and it was this this kind of um, uh, strange and upsetting time because so many people were knocked back and hurt and suffering from that. But luckily, the studio was in an area where it didn't lose power, so we still were coming into work every day and working on the record. And it was a bit there was something kind of melancholy because we were like, "We're making this record cool," but uh, but if you went outside, you saw that you know it really had messed everything up. And and the record itself, I think the way we sequenced it, it, it has a bit of what I like to think of. Had it has kind of the 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 flow of a storm. It kind of starts as one thing. It hits these kind of peaks and these high, highs and lows, and there's some valleys in and up there. And so it just kind of came out. And I was like, oh, Six Day Hurricane. It just ha has had, had that kind of natural ring to it. And it was kind of a whirlwind the way that we recorded it. And there was an actual, you know, whirlwind that Mother Nature had, had dealt the East Coast at the same, same time. And then I told it to my producer, Tad, and he was like, so I was like, great. <laughs> <laughs> John, uh, thank you so much for talking to me. Congratulations on the album. Thank you. And uh, I can't wait to watch you perform. John's going to perform in just a few minutes, you guys.